Hello, everybody. I'm Jody Schneider. I'm president of the Foreign Correspondents Club in Hong Kong, and I wanted to welcome you to tonight's Zoom event, Divorce, Decoupling, or Conflict, Sino-American Relations and the New Cold War. Uh, before I introduce our esteemed speakers, uh, I wanted to just tell you a few things. First of all, this will be, um, this is being recorded and will be on our YouTube and on the FCC uh, website uh, later this evening or tomorrow morning. So you can check it out there and please uh, direct others there. Uh, you can also ask questions. Uh, the place to do that, please send them to question, singular, question at fcchk.org. Again, that's question singular at fcchk.org, and um, we will uh, ask them to, of our panelists. So let me get right to introducing our, oh, one, one other thing before um, I introduce our panelists. We have another Zoom event coming up. Uh, it's a Zoom lunch event on the uh, 18th of August. Uh, it is called Black Lives Matter Down Under, Racism in Modern Australia with Stan Grant, formerly of CNN, and he'll be in conversation with CNN anchor Christy Lou Stout. So please uh, go ahead and book for that. It's another Zoom event. Uh, so now I will introduce our panelists. They include, they, our event tonight is moderated by Keith Richberg, who is an FCC correspondent governor member and director of the Journalism and Media Studies Center at the University of Hong Kong. He was formerly the bureau chief uh, for the Washington Post in Beijing, Shanghai, and Hong Kong, among other places. Uh, also with Keith tonight is Ling Ling Wei, who's an award-winning senior China correspondent. She uh, was based at the Wall Street Journal's Beijing Bureau from 2011 until China expelled journal reporters uh, earlier this year. She comes from a farm province in southeastern China. And she came of age as a journalist in New York and returned to China in early 2011. She is a co-author with Bob Davis of a new book, Superpower Showdown, How the Battle Between Trump and Xi Threatens a New Cold War. Very timely topic. We're happy to have her. Also on our panel tonight is Mary Gallagher, who's a professor at the University of Michigan. She's been director of the Liebenthal Rogel Center for Chinese Studies since 2008 and in July was appointed director of the university's International Institute. Uh, she's been a lot of things, but she was in 2012 and 2013, she was a visiting professor, professor uh, at uh, Shanghai's uh, Jingtao University, and she's an author of a number of books and articles on China. So we welcome Mary Gallagher. And we also have with us Bonnie Glazer, who's a senior advisor for Asia and director of the China Power Project at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, where she works on issues related to Chinese foreign and security policy. She's also a non-resident fellow with the Lowy Institute in Sydney, Australia, and a senior associate with the Pacific Forum. So I give you our esteemed panel uh, and Keith Richberg, our moderator. Please send along your questions. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for that, Jody. Uh, really appreciate that. Thank you. For for introducing this really esteemed panel. I'm really excited about this and I can't think of a more timely topic to be having right now. Uh, so let's jump right into it if we can. Uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, on July 23rd, Secretary of State Pompeo gave this speech where he talked about the need for an alliance of democracies to kind of counter this ideological conflict that he said is going on uh, between uh, the West and China. He basically called China an existential threat uh, Ling Ling, I want to start with you because you literally wrote the book on this topic. I can't think of a more timely book and a more timely title to have, <laughs> Superpower Showdown. I mean, it's, it's, absolutely, it's absolutely the correct title and the, and the correct thing that, to, to look at right now. Uh, please explain basically the premise of your book and tell us how did we get here? How did we get to this point of a new Cold War? Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Keith and Jody, for the invite. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, Ray, uh, how did we get here? Um, so obviously, uh, Donald Trump's uh, trade war with China is the most obvious sign of the declining relations. Uh, but we think that early fissures really appeared about a decade earlier during the global financial crisis. So during that time, um, you know, the 2008 global financial crisis, it really represents the high point you know, in some way of the U.S.-China coordination, right? George W. Bush called Chinese leader Hu Jintao twice in a month in the fall of 2008. 
eight, you know, to uh, get Hu Jintao to come to Washington and help him pull the global economy out of recession. So that was when, uh, but in, on the other hand, that was also when the paths of these two countries began to diverge in Beijing uh, because of uh, what uh, the U.S., you know, uh, the, how the financial system in the U.S. and much of the Western world really, you know, um, uh, uh, performed, you know, it was a deep crisis. Chinese leaders no longer saw the U.S. as a model to emulate, at least economically, and started to pursue more independent foreign and economic policies. And the stimulus plan back then also led to enormous overproduction of commodities like steel and tires, which flooded U.S. markets and battered factory towns across the Midwest and Southeast. Those places later would become the centers of a populist backlash with China as a target. So, uh, uh, and then fast forward to 2012, late 2012, that's what that was when President Xi Jinping came to power. So he pursued a very, a much more aggressive and policy that, you know, make China uh, increasingly assertive uh, economically, technologically, and uh, geopolitically. The, China, the Made in China 2020, 2025 industrial plan um, was, you know, to a lot of people in the West, especially in the U.S., including the U.S. business community, it was a very clear sign that China, you know, wanted to um, be really more dependent on its own technology and uh, capabilities, and at, at the expense of a lot of foreign companies. So we really, this is uh, many years in the making. It really, um, you know. In, in some ways, it, it's a long time coming. So that, that's how we got where we are today. And, and Ling Ling, you, you actually were kind of a personal casualty of this new, uh, new Cold War going on because you were asked to leave China uh, as part of this kind of tit for tat going on uh, between America and China regarding journalists. Could you tell, tell us a little bit about how, what happened to you and, and what you think more broadly about this kind of journalistic uh, Cold War tit for tat going on. Uh, sure. I was called Pao Hui in China. Uh, it's, uh, it means bomb ashes, basically collateral damage. Um, it's very unfortunate that like, so many journalists, you know, um, many of my colleagues in the, at the Washington Post and uh, New York Times, and so many Chinese journalists, uh, you know, working in Washington or uh, elsewhere in America, you know, mm -hmm. we, we have got caught up in this whole political crossfire. It's very unfortunate because this is a time when we need uh, more channels to, you know, communicate, to really understand what's going on in both countries, not fewer. So I think this is really not, this kind of tit for tat exposure to journalists really is not in either country's interest. As to me personally, um, <laughs> Maybe um, I'm an optimist after all. I tend to look at the bright side of things. You know, I off, uh, before I left, I often, obviously was very distraught and had many conversations, especially with my family. And my parents, you know, their generation, they have been through so much. The Cultural Revolution, uh, Great Leap Forward, the hunger, the political upheavals. So for them, their life it, it has all about just to survive, you know, forget about dreams and opportunities. But for our generation, especially in my case, I still had this choice of kept packing up and leave, leaving China. And that's what I did. Now that I'm back in New York, that's what I, the choice I made back in New York, but I will continue to write about China. Mm -hmm. Well, 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 we'll want to get back to you and talk about that a little bit more, but I, I want to bring Mary Gallagher in here. Uh, Mary may not remember, but I used to call her from Beijing and quote her when I was writing stories about the, what was happening in China, especially with the, uh, the labor uh, unrest that was going on at the Foxconn plants, et cetera, et cetera. You, uh, Mary, you've looked a lot at internal dynamics in China 
How is this Cold War, do you think, playing inside of China itself? I mean, is the does Xi Jinping have a kind of a nationalistic or patriotic constituency that likes this kind of confrontation? Or do you think he's maybe pushing the edge a bit too much? That's a good question. I, f I think that, you know, Xi Jinping in China um, is a popular leader, uh, particularly among, he's a populist leader in some ways um, within China, particularly in standing up to what's considered to be a kind of, you know, bullying policy by the, the Trump administration. So I don't think actually among the people that I interact with uh, the most in China, academics and business people, he's particularly popular. And I, I think that a lot of what he's done over the last couple of years has um, alienated um, that strata of Chinese society. But I think uh, among maybe the common people in China, there's a sense that China needs a strong leader, right, to lead them through a particularly unstable time in, um, in global politics. Um, China's domestic problems, um, I think right now, at least globally, are a little bit underemphasized because of the pandemic and the pandemic's effect in places like the United States. So I think right now we're not looking um, very carefully at what are some of the structural and kind of long-term problems that, that China has, uh, like slowing growth, like inequality, like land in the countryside and in suburban parts of the cities, those problems um, will continue to present themselves to the Chinese leadership. But I think right now, because everyone is focused on the on the pandemic, we're not really focusing on these longer term issues. If if we looked at the National People's Congress, um, the meetings that were delayed and then held in May, you know, like um, like a lot of countries around the world, including the United States, the focus has been on the economy and on unemployment. Uh, both countries um, have weak welfare states and are having trouble, I think, dealing with the massive unemployment that the pandemic's created. Uh, and for China in particular, the, the people who are most hard hit by the pandemic and by the unemployment caused by the pandemic are rural migrant workers. And that'll continue to be a problem because the government needs, wants to um, urbanize these people, give them uh, stable jobs, give them social security as they age. Um, and there hasn't been a lot of progress uh, in that regard since uh, Xi Jinping took office. So he's a strong leader. And I think globally, he, um, you know, China, Chinese people like when their leaders garner respect around the world. And uh, he certainly has played his hand as a very strong leader. But I think for, for, for at least some part of the population, I think there's a sense that he might have overplayed it, at least in the last couple of years. And just to follow up that point, Mary, because when I was in China, a lot of the stories that we, myself, other journalists were writing was about uh, labor unrest. There was rural unrest. People were demonstrating about land grab, illegal land grabs. There were uh, problems about corruption going on. You could see there was a lot of anger uh, with these kind of spontaneous demonstrations and protests, sometimes the hundreds of them every month. Um, is that is that over now? No, it's not over. Um, I think two things happened that changed the dynamics. First is the anti-corruption campaign. So the anti-corruption campaign d has had an effect on how officials behave. Um, mm -hmm. There's much less opportunity to um, to grab what you can. And I think there's a fear. So, you know, there's a problem of inaction as well. There's, there's a reduction in corruption, but also there's a kind of reduction in, in what governments, local governments are doing that, that might be inhibiting economic growth. Because a lot of the mm -hmm. corruption that happened in China happened alongside economic growth, right? The other issue that's changed is that there's been a massive crackdown in China on social activists, including labor activists, lawyers, um, civil society in general. And uh, so what you still see, you know, strikes are still occurring at Chinese workplaces, a lot of them about unemployment and about wage arrears, uh, but the organizational mechanisms behind them have been um, at least temporarily suppressed. And so you don't see the same amount of coordination. And <clears throat> like when you were covering Foxconn and, and, and say the Honda strike in 2012, those things were aided and abetted by, by activists who could, who could string people together in, in strikes that could have a, a big effect on, on policy. Um, and the other thing that, of course, at the time, um, the government, uh, Hu Jintao's uh, administration, uh, had policy goals that sort of went alongside the strikes. It wanted to raise wages. It wanted to raise protections. 
you don't see those same, um, the same kind of synergy between what the government wants and what workers want. Mm -hmm. Fascinating stuff. Uh, Bonnie Glazer, let me bring you in here because I know you've done a lot of research on military issues and the Chinese military specifically. There's right now, as we speak, a lot of ships and planes moving in a very tiny little area called the South China Sea. What, what, what are the chances of an accident and what are the chances this Cold War could accidentally become a hot war? Well, lots of people are asking that question, Keith. Uh, thanks for having me. Actually, my focus is really more on Chinese foreign and security policy than it is on you know, the nuts and bolts and bean counting uh, of the PLA. But um, you know, everybody is looking at the Taiwan Strait and the South China Sea and suggesting that there, there um, are, might be chances of a collision. I don't know if you noticed, there was a piece yesterday in the South China Morning Post which cited anonymous sources uh, indicating that China won't fire the first shot, is not looking for a military confrontation with the United States. Um, I, I think this is, if true, it is important and would not be the first time that uh, we have heard that actually Xi Jinping in the past has instructed operators, I have been told by, uh, uh, by Chinese military officers, that the word has come down in the past to uh, avoid any kind of uh, accident with US forces. I don't really don't think that a, any kind of a, uh, of a hot war or you know, a, even just an accident is really in, in China's interests uh, at this point. Uh, particularly in the case of Taiwan, I just don't see a major strike against Taiwan is imminent. You know, some people are talking about seizing the, uh, the, the Pradis or Dongsha uh, Islands. Um, I think that's even unlikely because Taiwan now has Marines deployed on them. And um, if, if the Chinese want to alienate the almost um, 24 million people of Taiwan, then uh, they can go ahead and kill Taiwan's Marines. Uh, but I don't think that that's going to change the policy of the Tsai Ing-wen administration and cause her to accept the one China principle or the 1992 uh, consensus. But one of the reasons why I think we have a real uptick now um, in the region in terms of military deployments and exercises uh, is because of the COVID crisis and, and the pandemic really um, uh, caused, I think, uh, initially uh, quite a large number of, uh, of infections in the U.S. military that were very widely reported. We had one of our aircraft carriers that was um, basically stranded or staying in Guam with a lot of people hospitalized. And there was this narrative uh, in China that we saw in some of the media that U.S. military preparedness was really quite low. I think that led people to be concerned about the potential for uh, miscalculation on Beijing's part. And then the United States, of course, sent two aircraft carrier uh, battle groups to the South China Sea the first time it has done so since 2014. And whenever these, um, uh, the US takes actions, the Chinese, I think, feel compelled, as we know sovereignty is such a sensitive and high priority issue for Xi Jinping, they feel compelled uh, to respond. And so the Chinese, of course, have large exercises that they are carrying out in the South China Sea. So we all know we had an accident in 2001. Um, uh, it, it could happen again. Even in um, uh, 2018, the Chinese positioned a destroyer in the path of a US destroyer during a freedom of navigation operation. Very dangerous. The US read the riot act to the Chinese. And uh, if they did something like that again, then you know, sure, potentially, we could have a crisis. And I would just um, highlight that if, if, if we did, you know, in 2001, we certainly had a political crisis, but we had mechanisms, um, at least a, a sort of modicum of trust, um, some dialogues uh, between our two countries. Right now, I think just virtually, None of this uh, exists. And so the ability to manage a crisis, and particularly, I think, domestically in China, would just be very, very difficult. And, and staying on that theme for just a second, Bonnie, could, uh, talk about China's foreign policy for a second here, because they they spread a lot of money around, Belt and Road Initiative, all of this, especially in Southeast Asia. Uh, but they don't seem to be having winning a lot of strategic allies for their money. Uh, is it true, then, that money can't buy you love? 
Um, money can sometimes um, uh, buy you silence. And I think that more often than not, that's what we see. Um, we don't see uh, Muslim uh, uh, countries, for example, criticizing what's going on in Xinjiang. Uh, and uh, many countries do not uh, uh, side with uh, the United States because they want to get loans. Um, or they don't directly criticize um, uh, China because they want to get uh, more money. They, they want these projects. Uh, most of these countries don't really have alternatives. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, money from the United States or you know, sloshing around for, for infrastructure projects. Uh, Japan is a better alternative, in fact, than the United States is. But even then, uh, there's limits. So I think mostly what, what, what China gets is countries that will vote with it, like you know, in the UN Human Rights Council, for example, um, or uh, remain uh, silent when, uh, when, other, when Western countries are criticizing China. And that is important to Beijing. That's terrific. We've just learned that. Money can't buy you love, but it can buy you silence. <laughs> and Ling Ling, let me come back to you because you were a, a journalist on the ground out there talking to people. You speak the language. You can mingle with people better than I could ever do when you're in China. I mean, what do average, ordinary people you talk to in China think about this kind of the growth of China, but also this confrontation with the West? Are they, are they on board with this? Uh, uh, a very concerning trend um, that has been going on in China in, you know, recent months, uh, especially, is this um, uh, nationalistic sentiment. Um, you know, uh, Bonnie mentioned um, how the uh, coronavirus pandemic, you know, really um, affected uh, the relationship between the U.S. and China. It was really true. You know, um, before the uh, coronavirus virus pandemic, you know, we had this phase one trade agreement and everybody sort of like breathed a sigh of relief. Okay, we finally can put this aside, you know, for, for a little while now. And the pandemic occurred, right? Totally deepened the kind of mistrust on both sides. And China constantly became a source of, uh, you know, uh, contention in terms of how the vi virus got started and the China's war warriors didn't help either, you know, pointing fingers at the U.S. military. So you just mm -hmm. saw this. That's really uh, triggered the re the most recent downward spiral of the relationship, and for the Chinese public, and they think the U.S. has done such a terrible job containing the virus, right? Uh, so, what? Well, in what composition are you in, pointing fingers at China? Um, as Mary mentioned earlier, um, Xi Jinping really is enjoying a genuine sense of support from, from a lot of Lao Bai Xing, the ordinary people. They think he has done a brilliant job containing the virus. And the, some of the populist programs like poverty uh, alleviation, even though there are many, many issues with that program, but still you do see some people getting help. A big help from the government. So um, on the streets, you know, people are very, um, you know, proud of, 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 you know, China's response. And most recently, the kind of crackdown from Washington, cascade of actions against Chinese tech companies, uh, by, uh, by the dance, the TikTok uh, app, and most recently, uh, Tencent WeChat platform. Um, that's another thing that really got the Chinese worked up. They, because those companies, I mean, TikTok is a rare uh, software, soft uh, power wing for Beijing, right? Uh, I don't believe any of the comments about Chinese government doesn't care about TikTok. Of course they care. Um, and uh, Tencent is one of the most successful, valuable firms in China. WeChat we use WeChat. Uh, I don't know if Bonnie and Mary use WeChat. If you communicate with people in China, be you a business person or official in, or uh, uh, someone in academia, if you communicate people in China, you use WeChat. You don't use email. You don't use, use of course, Facebook and other forms are blocked. So those actions, um, you know, it, 
it, it just really, um, you know, uh, not only rattled the leadership compound in Zhongnan Hai, but also it made the ordinary people and some of them uh, more market leaning and liberal thinkers are like, what is the end game here? What is it that the U.S. really wants to do here? And you, if you say that those firms uh, still American citizens' data and pass along to the government, then show us the evidence. So mm. those are very serious uh, accusations, not really being backed up by evidence. So that's, you know, but, and, and uh, all those rhetorics and together, it just really, I mean, you ask me questions really about what the ordinary Chinese think, people think about mm -hmm. this. So that's what their view is. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And for the record, I have never used TikTok. I can tell you that now. <laughs> but, uh, me neither. <laughs> Mary but my okay. son might. <laughs> Ling Ling Wei has not used TikTok either. Mary Gallagher, have you used TikTok? No. Um, so my children do use TikTok, but uh -huh. I have teenagers. Uh, they love TikTok. Um, I have participated in watching TikTok, but I have never danced on TikTok, which is very uh, Okay. <laughs> well, I will ask you a more serious question, Mary Gallagher, because you're in my home state of Michigan, uh, headquarters of the United Auto Workers. So I want to ask you the opposite question. I asked Ling Ling about ordinary people in China, but you're in Michigan. It's a union state. It's an auto worker state. You know, you're next to Ohio, another big auto worker state. How do how does the average American feel about this conflict going on between the U.S. and China? Are they actually supporting what President Trump is trying to do? Um, so I think if if we look at American popular opinion about China, I would have to say up until the pandemic, up until this year, um, popular opinion about China was more positive than opinion in D.C. So, you know, there was a trend in D.C. that was becoming very um, anti-China or, or more um, um, wanting to have U.S. policy, bilateral, I mean, bipartisan, really, to have a tougher China policy, right? Going back to the article by um, Eli Ratner and Kurt Campbell a couple of years ago, that um, the engagement policy had failed and that we needed a new policy, right? So that, that happened in D.C., I would have to say, before public opinion really took a nosedive. The pandemic and probably in longer term trends that, that Ling Ling was just talking about related to import competition with China, the whole China shock thing that economists started talking about several years ago, um, that, was lead, that was part of a broader trend downward. But the pandemic, I think, had this much larger effect. So Pew's recent research, I think, in July showed that um, close to 70% of Americans now have an unfavorable view of, of China. In Michigan, um, which is, of course, uh, one of the states that was more hard hit, although certainly not the hardest hit, the hardest hit states in terms of import competition are really in the southeast, um, uh, places like Kentucky, Ohio, Tennessee, North Carolina, where there was import competition in, in sectors like furniture, textiles. Those industries have, by and large, left those states. Autos are, you know, the auto industry is different. It's a global industry. But many, many American companies are doing well in China, including General Motors. And so I don't think that it's been as sharp a decline in places like Michigan because we benefit from having our, our firms be globally competitive. Um, Trump, uh, Trump's win in 2016 was partly due to winning states like Michigan. And so I do think the rhetoric of blaming China for America's downturn um, has been successful in, in states like Michigan. So it is, it's had a, you know, the, the import competition with China that began after China joined WTO has had a major impact on American politics. Uh, we now have a Republican party that is led by a leader who is no way supportive of free trade. And um, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out in, uh, in November. But well, thank you for that. And Bonnie Glazer, I am not going to ask you about your TikTok appearances, but I, I will ask you, uh, where, <laughs> where is this heading? Are we really heading towards a decoupling or is the, is the world and particularly Asia, are they going to be asked to choose between either a U.S. led system or a Chinese led system? Where do you, how do, tell me in the words of David Petraeus, tell me how this ends. <laughs> uh, I don't know how it ends, but um... 
um, uh, probably Ling Ling can, can uh, g give us some data about uh, companies. Um, there's, as, as you know, uh, AmCham has done quite a number of surveys and, uh, and, and, and it looks like uh, that there is a, a limited trend of companies that are really pulling out of China. It obviously depends on what sector they're in, and, but if you're exporting to the Chinese market, you know, you want to be there. Um, and there, uh, there's been a longer term uh, trend of diversification, certainly. I don't think the Trump administration has had all that much uh, success in uh, convincing uh, companies to, to reshore plants back uh, to the United States. Uh, but of course, the US is not the only country that has these concerns. Um, and uh, we see like Japan having created the $2.2 billion fund uh, to try and provide incentives to some of their companies to move uh, out of uh, uh, China, if not to Japan, um, then, uh, then to Southeast Asia. Um, and, and so those kinds of incentives are also different kinds of incentives, not just money are being provided by Taiwan. Uh, so we do, we do see this trend, but I don't think anybody is talking about a wholesale decoupling. It's targeted, it's uh, supply chains that um, relate to national security where there's a perceived vulner vulnerability. Of course, this started in telecoms, um, now it's pharmaceuticals and other medical supply chains. Uh, so there's still, um, uh, I think, more moves that the administration has in its back pocket. Um, in fact, Pompeo referred to this just the other day. Um, I, I think they have a, just a long list of things they're going to roll out. And sometimes I think they test things and then decide that they're a bit too over the top. And I would put in that category the uh, uh, banning of Chinese Communist Party members, not providing them a visa. I just think they decided that was a bit, uh, a bit too much but they will uh, do more. I think increasingly uh, people are concerned about uh, one, the period now uh, up until the elections. And because now that Trump has said, and he repeated this, I think yesterday to Fox News, uh, that he doesn't have a good relationship with Xi Jinping anymore, that's all over. So now that he's really taken the gloves off, uh, it, this has enabled other people in the administration to do things. Uh, regarding, for example, Xinjiang and Hong Kong, that the president was not on board with when the trade negotiations were going on. So I think that's important. And that, that period, we're going to see a lot more ramping up uh, of, of pressure. And then uh, if Trump doesn't get elect, reelected, then we have uh, a period, of course, between the election and the January 20th inauguration. I think so, um, Americans are some of us are worried about maybe how he will challenge the results. Um, uh, he might even try to um, stay in, in office a little longer. Hopefully members of Congress um, uh, would go and drag him out of the White House. They have already <laughs> signaled that they, they would not support that. Uh, but the president is suggesting that, uh, that we could have you know, Russian interference, Chinese interference in, in our election. So th this is, this is going to be, um, I think, muddy and maybe even ugly. And Bonnie, let me stay with you, and I'm going to go in reverse order and ask everybody the same question here. It's a question that I had on my list, but it also comes in from Vicky Wong at RTHK, Radio Television Hong Kong here, uh, asking, what, will, what would Sino-American relations be like under a Biden-Harris administration? Start with you, Bonnie, and then go to Mary, and then Ling Ling. Um, great question. Um, and uh, we could, of course, also talk about what it might be like at a second Trump administration, because I don't think it would continue in the same trajectory. And we might be see a little bit of a reset from the president as he wants to be best friends with Xi Jinping again. But um, I'll just highlight quickly maybe um, uh, three or four areas where I think that there would be differences. But I'll start out by saying the assessment of the challenges that uh, China poses to the United States and the world and particularly democratic societies and the world order would be very similar. Uh, but I doubt that it would be seen as an existential threat. And I don't think that we would see a Biden administration on a daily basis um, hammering China and highlighting the difference between the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese people, that sort of ideological component of policy, I think, would disappear. There would be human rights and other you know, sort of ideological components, but that would disappear. 
But the three areas that I think would be particularly um, uh, different is uh, emphasis on uh, alliances and working with our partners and allies uh, to push back against Chinese practices that we see as uh, objectionable. Uh, so uh, certainly we wouldn't be uh, demanding that South Korea and Japan just pay sort of, you know, ridiculously ex exorbitant amounts for uh, our bases there and uh, imposing tariffs on, uh, on, on the Europeans. Uh, but of course, Biden would inherit the tariffs and he's not going to give them up unilaterally. It might provide him with some useful leverage if we get into new trade negotiations uh, with, with China. Secondly, um, I think that uh, the dialogue mechanisms that have almost, uh, almost um, uh, completely atrophied in this administration uh, would be restructured, not necessarily um, restored as they existed in the Obama administration, but I think there would be a restructuring of dialogue in a sense that sustained um, uh, dialogue with China is important if we are going to address some of the problems that we have. Um, hopefully nothing like a strategic and economic dialogue, but something new. And then thirdly, um, uh, whereas the Trump administration has been focused exclusively on what uh, I would call not just competition, but confrontation with China. I think there would be an effort to uh, resurrect some cooperation with China. And Vice President Biden, of course, talks about um, the need to work on uh, combating uh, global warming and uh, issues like, of course, pandemics uh, and uh, non-proliferation, um, particularly North Korea. Uh, the vice president has talked about, about that. So I think that those are some areas where we would see some differences. But of course, there's really no going back to the policies that were perceived earlier. And Vice President Biden, having had eight years experience um, and seen the evolution of Chinese policies, um, beginning before Xi Jinping, but of course, um, accelerating um, after that, uh, both of course in you know, trade, economics, security, foreign policy, uh, diplomacy, all of these, um, I think that he uh, takes a, he, that he took away some lessons from that period and his own assessment of China, I believe, has changed. That's fascinating. I covered Biden's trip there to China during that period yeah. when he was trying to make nice. They were both vice president at the time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Mary, Gall Mary Gallagher. <laughs> Mary Gallagher, and I ask you the same question, but with a slight spin. And again, this is a question coming from our vice president, Eric Wishart, very, very similar. He says, if Biden and Harris win, what policy should the new administration take on China? Or what steps should they take to end the Cold War while also having a, a cohesive policy on human rights? Now, so you are now the advisor. You're sitting in the National Security Council. You're the uh, senior Asia person. And then Biden and Harris turn to you and say, Professor Gallagher, what should we do? That's a great question. Um, I, I, I first just have to say in terms of the... Um, the ticket, which was just announced uh, yesterday in the U.S., that um, I think it's a super in exciting ticket, Biden-Harris. And I love that a Black, Jamaican, Asian, immigrant parent, you know, child of immigrants is the safe choice for Joe Biden. I mean, it says so much about American politics that is good and exciting that Kamala Harris is the safe choice for VP. So I'm super enthusiastic about it. Um, I think that, um, I totally agree with what Bonnie just said. I won't repeat those points. Those are really important points. Um, related, I think one thing that will be um, different and that I would, I would certainly advise is to stop thinking about China as the Soviet Union. It is nothing like the Soviet Union. It is not going to disappear. So when we talk about the Cold War, the Cold War ended because the Soviet Union disappeared. China's not disappearing. China in some entity will always exist. And so there has to be some kind of coexistence with China. Um, and the, the, the attempts by um, the Trump administration to foment regime change is similar to the engagement policy. The engagement policy was about changing China. I mean, it wasn't really, but it has become that in sort of in its legacy. But a, a confrontational kind of Cold War-like mentality is also about changing China. So I think that we have to learn how to coexist with China in a way that accepts that it poses a lot of challenges and is the system is quite different. 
Um, I think though what the Biden administration should also do is to stand up to China on human rights issue and particularly on freedom of expression and freedom of speech, which is super important in Hong Kong, but it's also super important to us here because we interact with people. I mean, I teach Chinese students now. This semester I'll be teaching Chinese students who will be based in China. And I am now forced to worry about what do I say in my lectures? What do I say in my discussions that could somehow put my students at risk? So I think there has to be a kind of <laughs> a come to Jesus acceptance of this. Admit the, the Xi Jinping regime poses, it does pose existential questions about the freedom of speech and freedom of expression, which are American values that we have tried to uphold uh, globally. And I think that should be a focus of, of the Biden administration is um, preserving uh, and upholding those values. Interesting. And Ling Ling, I won't put you on the spot, although I do know there is a former Wall Street Journal reporter now working in the White House helping shape this policy. <laughs> but uh, uh, you're, you're, the, the subtitle of your book mentioned this as being the battle between Trump and Xi. If Trump is no longer there, how much do you think these policies would continue? Um, I also agree with Bonnie, um, you know, all those points. One is, uh, in particular, the tone will be better if it's a Biden administration, you know, as Bonnie pointed out, it won't be like daily basis of this belligerent uh, remarks against China. Um, so mm -hmm. I actually think uh, Beijing welcomes the Biden administration. Uh, there, um, the, uh, the next 90 days, um, I also agree, is going to be the most dangerous period of time uh, for China. Uh, you know, uh, Bonnie mentioned this South China Morning Post story about Xi Jinping instructing Chinese military not to fire the first shot. Uh, I think that's really a sign to sh uh, of how nervous uh, the leadership is uh, about this whole relationship completely getting out of control. They're trying mm. very hard to show restraint. Uh, don't don't really pay too much attention. I, you know, obviously we need to pay attention to the Wolf Warrior diplomats, but but the, that's not nothing new. Uh, you know, this kind of Wolf diplomat diplomacy um, was something employed by generations of Chinese leaders when it was in China's interest to you know basically take them out, like during Mao Zedong era and Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin. They're they're always there. It, it's really, um, you know, they had to fight back, it, it, you know, in terms of uh, uh, giving the public a sense of, uh, you know, uh, that, oh, we are standing up to uh, the American hegemon. Uh, but the mm -hmm. reality, um, they're trying to, you know, they are reacting to U.S. actions, but they're trying to not to be too provocative, not to fire mm -hmm. the first shot. So that's mm -hmm. what they're trying to do now. When Biden comes in, um, um, as, I, as we all, you know, all agreed earlier, the tone will be better, but it will, the Biden administration won't you know, basically um, uh, dramatically change uh, some of the policies, especially on trade and national security, but potentially could take a different approach. Um, and another thing that Chinese really like is um, if the Biden administration goes back to some of the multilateral organizations, you know, mm -hmm. uh, seek to uh, renew dialogues on issues like climate change, um, you know, that for the Chinese basically is an opening for renewed engagement with the U.S., unlike what we mm -hmm. are having now, which is very little engagement except for probably in the area, uh, area of trade. That's kind of ironic, isn't it? You know, the whole relationship started to crumble mm -hmm. in the area of trade. Now it's becoming one of the very few channels where the two sides still talk to each other. The upcoming trade talks, you, you know, around August mm -hmm. 15th, um, you know, uh, it's very important in that sense. Um, so, and, and another thing is that despite the fact that Trump said, you know, she's no longer my friend or, you know, uh, completely toned down his 
previously very enthusiastic remarks about this great leader from China, the relation, the professed relationship between Xi and Trump still, you know, hasn't completely collapsed either. So that give, also give, gives both sides a way out of, you know, a potential really dire situation. Mm -hmm. uh, Ling Ling, so let me just stay with you for one second because I had a question that came in a little bit earlier. It said, when you talk about the trade war, do you believe that the Trump administration has some legitimate issues in trade or is it just pure politics? Oh, definitely legitimate issues on trade. Um, mm -hmm. Especially, I, I really don't care about those purchases. I, I think I think that's really um, um, not what um, you know, some of the officials in administration had in mind when they first started, um, you know, the offensive, like Robert Lighthizer. The, the most legitimate issues concerning the structure issues that are not too much, you know, covered by the phase one trade deal. There are definitely, um, you know, a need for leveling the playing field for uh, foreign businesses in China and, and the private business overall. Some of the issues like, you know, um, better protect IP and, uh, you know, uh, reduce the forced tech transfer and greater market access. All those things are really in the interest, long-term interest of China's economy. But, but why, but why not? Why is Xi Jinping's government not really carrying out those, those changes? I mean, one major, the, at the core of the issue, it really is the party's control, right? If, if those changes, you know, in any way would erode the party's control over China, then, you know, the resistance it, it, it will remain to be very huge. huge. So I, I think definitely legi legitimate um, demands, but, but the question is, you know, uh, where China change? I mean, we have already seen in the past two years, foreign pressure no longer was good for reforms in China. So no, if they really uh, want to change and going to change certain things, the pressure has to come from within. Very interesting. And Mary, you had a very similar question came into you from our, one of our members, Fred uh, Dimopoulos, I believe it's pronounced. It says uh, you'd mentioned earlier in your, some comments something about bullying. And would you say that the United States does or does not have legitimate grievances against China when it comes to trade policy? That was to Mary. Uh, yeah, I agree with Ling Ling. Absolutely, there are, um, there are legitimate issues. And I think there are legitimate issues related to things that, the, that, that Secretary of State Pompeo mentioned in his speech um, a couple of weeks ago where he, you know, or a few weeks ago now, was, was calling for um, people in China to, uh, to, to rise up in a sense. And I think, I think that the, the, that message um, is counterproductive uh, for achieving some of the things that the United States wants and, and that probably some people in China as well as private businesses in China want, which is economic uh, liberalization and um, a, a more politically open atmosphere in China. I think many people in China want that. And it was, it was clear, for example, at the beginning of the pandemic when uh, Dr. Li Wenliang uh, spoke out about the virus early on to his friends and then was later uh, punished by the, the local authorities. <clears throat> uh, initially, the outpouring of, of rage on the Chinese um, internet about it was, was directed at the, the regime and including the central government for um, not allowing this news to come out um, earlier. So um, there, are, there are legitimate issues across the board related to trade, to politics, to Xinjiang, to Hong Kong. Um, but the the delivery of the message, I think, is is counterproductive, and I and I totally agree with Lingling Ling that a, a change in tone and a change in tactics um, is needed. It's counterproductive to alienate the Chinese people um, by 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 having leaders in the United States call for regime change. Mm -hmm. Great, and uh, uh, Bonnie Glazer, a question that looks like it might be a good one for you. Uh, from member FCC member Tony Watson, who's asking, uh, to what extent does China's food insecurity limit its ability to act against Western countries? And uh, they say specifically, look at the Five Eyes countries that all export food to China. Yeah, I don't know if uh, um, 
that that's an issue that I, I yeah, I don't really follow that closely. I mean, obviously China doesn't produce enough uh, food to feed its people. Uh, and it has been going around the world in places even like Australia, you know, buying up land uh, and, and, and needs to uh, get uh, to import food. So, you know, critically uh, important vulnerability that China has going forward. And Mary talked earlier about many of the challenges that China faces, you know, demographics, probably the one that we talk about the most often, but food security is absolutely um, on that list. Uh, and uh, uh, that's, that's an area where, um, um, you know, there are probably people in the Trump administration who see that vulnerability and might even want to take advantage of it. Uh, but uh, that's that's something that Xi Jinping is is clearly going to be worried about going forward. I mean, China's going to have to continue to import food. Mm -hmm. uh, Mary, let me ask you a question, Mary Gallagher. You're the internal <laughs> China watcher on politics much to, much to a certain degree. Not only does Trump have his reelection, but Xi Jinping has a reelection coming up uh, another year or so. Uh, is he solid? <laughs> Does he have any constituencies he has to cater to? Does he have his own hawks that he has to deal with? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, unfortunately, we don't have the data to really understand uh, the, the black box of, uh, of the selectorate in China. Um, so we know, of course, that in 2018, there was a constitutional revision that will allow Xi Jinping to stay on as, as president for, for more than two terms. Um, my understanding is that we fully expect him to, to do so, uh, to take on a, a, a third term, so to, to outlive, um, to outlast uh, you know, people prior to him, including Hu Jintao and, and, and Jiang Zemin, who for the most part you know, respected this, this kind of developing norm that, that began in the 1990s. Um, my sense, uh, and this is a sense, this is not uh, based on, I would have to say, um, excellent data. Uh, my sense is, is that if, if Xi Jinping aspires to a fourth term, a fifth term, there will be increasing uh, resistance. And just generally, because this uh, now sy the system has become more deinstitutionalized, I think there will be greater instability um, below him as uh, the uncertainty of when he will step down how he will step down and who will take his place. That has, those three things have become very, very unclear. And the increasing uncertainty, I think, is dangerous for the Chinese Communist Party. Uh huh. Now, now Ling Ling, I saw you chuckling at that question. So I'm going to give you a chance to answer it. Xi Jinping, third term. Does he have a, does he have a shot for a third term? <laughs> Well, I, I think um, Mary's answer, um, you know, um, it's very, um, basically, um, I think she had the perfect answer there. Um, because uh, we, we really don't, uh, and really a lot of speculation here on, on my part. I, I think, I, I think she, he, he can just uh, basically um, uh, stay in power for as long as he wants, you know, based on you know how uh, the, the 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 how the politics works uh, in China now. Uh, I don't think he there are any meaningful challenges to his rule. Um, but I do think I do think uh, if he doesn't handle the U.S.-China relationship well, that could become really uh, an issue for him because generations of Chinese leaders they're uh, judged. Uh, among many things by how they handle the U.S.-China relationship, right? Mao Zedong, for all his fault, all uh, his, you know, the mistakes, he did um, form the tie with the U.S., right? Establish the former diplomatic relationship. And Deng Xiaoping further advanced the, the relationship and became, uh, the relation became better under Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, even though that was also kind of turning point. Um, she, you know, there are some people in China these days uh, kind of was amazed how fast uh, the bilateral relationship soured over the past six months. 
you know, some people even say, wow, way to lose US just in a few months period. So um, you can't just blame the US, blame Trump. You know, it, it, it just doesn't work that way. Um, if there are any kind of confrontations down the road or China's economy tanks because of this, you know, there will be um, revaluations within the party and, and that would be a problem for Xi. But for now, we're really not seeing any kind of meaningful challenges to his rule. You know, their, their descendants, they get it rounded up, the journalists doing investigative reporting, they're either getting kicked out or, you know, just left the profession because they knew there's no hope to continue their, uh, their mm -hmm. work with too much risk. And human rights lawyers are getting rounded up. So, and and you the elite circles obviously in private they complain because, you know their perks getting taken away. You know their lives no longer as it was before. Um, but there's no other uh, force that really is standing out right now that can mount a legitimate uh, a meaningful challenge to the current leadership. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have it on the record here. Mary and Ling Ling both predict Xi Jinping will win a third term. Now, <laughs> Bonnie, we have a question here. Uh, last question for you, I think. Uh, uh, do you think the China's fairly measured response, someone's dog needs walking, do you think China's fairly measured response to the U.S. Uh, trade uh, actions means that China's access to U.S. capital can be significantly curtailed at a low economic cost. Yeah, I'm gonna throw that to somebody else. That's really not <laughs> my area of expertise. <laughs> Sorry, Ling Ling, you wanna take that? Anybody wanna take that? China's fairly measured retaliation on trade so it seems to reinforce the Trump administration's expectation that access to US markets and capital can be significantly constrained with little economic cost. Anybody wanna try that one? Uh, That's from our member, Maka. <laughs> okay, that, uh, I, I mean, I'm going to try, but I, I don't know uh, how um, informed my give, answer is going to be. Give, so, give it anyway, a try, it'll be very informed. <laughs> but anyway, so um, right now, there's um, basically, you know, uh, the decoupling, I mean, uh, lack of a better term, uh, is happening in many sectors, right? Uh, you do see politicians in the U.S. are pushing for financial decoupling as well. That means, you know, curtailing Chinese companies' access to American capital um, and, 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 you know, the delisting um, effort. Uh, but, but I personally, I, I do think that is a misguided effort because um, Chinese uh, companies, and because so many global investors and including American investors are already uh, very much exposed to China's market, Chinese companies. Uh, act, having them listed in the US, you know, even though they're not meeting the very high standards of auditing and reporting, they still need to meet certain standards to be listed there and kicking them out for example, if they all go back to Shanghai and get listed in Shanghai Stock Exchanges, the standard, the reporting standards are even lower. So who suffer? It's really the investors, including American investors, suffer because they would be more in the dark in terms of how you know those companies' financials and and their operations. So I, I do I, I do think you know I hope you know policymakers in the U.S. could really think twice before you know, making that move. And then again, uh, back to the Biden administration question. If Biden administration, you know, there is a Biden administration, and, and the big question I have is how much of a sway Wall Street has over Biden, as opposed, you know, mm -hmm. we, we see that Wall Street do not have too much of sway over Trump, except for the market up and down. So, you know, that might make him change mind. But, but if Wall Street, you know, has more of an influence over Biden. And we all know how those Wall Street, how much the, those Wall Street firms want to access China's financial market. Maybe, mm -hmm. you know, they're, 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 you know, they can play a role in terms of, uh, you know, to figuring out you know, uh, 
lack of a better term, you know, what's the best solution to both trying to get Chinese companies to here to hire reporting genders and also we're not talking about, you know, this very, this very unrealistic concept of financial decoupling. Well, uh, the, your book is called Superpower Showdown, How the Battle Between Trump and Xi Threatens a New Cold War. We're all going to be reading that now, but I just want to ask you in a lightning round, final question, everybody, we'll start with Bonnie. What are you reading this summer? What can you recommend on this topic or any other interesting topic? Bonnie Glazer, summer reading list. Summer reading list. Um, uh, I've been, I guess on the, on the China front, uh, I read uh, Dan Markey's uh, China's Western Horizon, which is about China's relations with uh, South, South uh, Central and uh, South and Central Asia and some countries in the Middle East, um, mm -hmm. which I thought was really quite good because it goes into how these are interactive relationships. China's do China doesn't unilaterally drive the direction of relationships with countries. They, um, if there's give and take, um, he starts his book with the story about Gwadar uh, and uh, the port and how it was really the idea of the Pakistanis, not China's um, initiative. Um, I've read Michael um, Schumann's Superpower Interrupted, which is a great uh, sort of overview of China's history um, and why China is committed now to national rejuvenation. Um, and then um, uh, there's, th there's a, a, a three books that's a science fiction, very well known in China. Some of you may have read it, but I have not, but I've decided um, that's what I'm reading at, at the beach uh, at, uh, in, in a week or so when I go, which starts with the three body problem. This was originally uh, written in Chinese and now uh, translated into English. But uh, President Obama apparently talked about this when he was president and said he loved the book. So I've, uh, I've just bought um, the, uh, the three and I plan to read them at the beach. All right. Bonnie Glazer is going to the beach. Wow. We're envious. <laughs> Mary Gallagher, what are you reading in Ann Arbor? Well, for the past um, few years, I've been reading more about American politics, um, partly as a focus on this impact of uh, import competition with China. So there are three books that I read in the past few years. Um, they're not all, they're, they're not really new. They're, they're a few years old now. Um, the first is uh, Hillbilly Elegy by J.D. Vance, which is about Kentucky, Ohio. Um, Strangers uh, in Their Own Land by Arlie Hochschild, which is about uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana. It's a really interesting book. Um, and then probably the most academic uh, of them, but also very interesting if you are interested in the politics of the upper Midwest, is The Politics of Resentment by Kathy Kramer, uh, which is about Wisconsin. Uh, those three books, really, I think if you wanna try to understand American politics around the 2016 election, uh, are great books about the the realignment of um, the kind of the Rust Belt um, and including places like Louisiana, which are are more about the chemical industry. Uh, but they mm -hmm. they're very informative about the the the, the turn towards a more populist, um, xenophobic um, America. Uh, a great podcast too is the 1619 podcast by the New York Times uh, about the history of slavery and racism in the United States. So um, I'm learning about my own country right now. Great recommendations. And Ling Ling, since you're not writing your own book now, you've got some time to actually read a book. <laughs> what are you reading? I've been reading Dr. Seuss, The Lorax. <laughs> Absolutely, excellent, excellent. Oh, well, it's just, uh, you know, having a young kid, um, no school, and that's just really, um, getting really uh, preoccupied trying to get him to read. But actually, I, you know, I never read it when I was a kid. I, now I'm just totally loving it. Now I finally know why it's so popular. Um, so uh, <laughs> a more serious book, uh, you know, I just tried to, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, Mary said uh, he, she's been reading to trying to gain be better understanding of the American history and politics. Uh, I'm kind of doing the same with, with China. Uh, been, uh, I've been rereading this great, great uh, book by Zhong Chang, Wild Swans. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's a fascinating, a very well-written, fascinating stories 
of uh, three generations of her family, you know, all the way back to her great grandmother uh, to her, and just uh, it's all personal stories, but illustrated the changes um, in modern China. So um, I've been reading that and just started what Bonnie mentioned, um, Michael Schumann's uh, superpower interrupted. We certainly have a lot of superpower themed uh, <laughs> articles or books coming out these days. Absolutely. Ling Ling Wei likes green eggs and ham. So <laughs> yeah. I want to thank uh, Ling Ling Wei, award-winning correspondent from the Wall Street Journal, Mary Gallagher from the greatest university in the world, the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor, my alma mater, Bonnie Glazer from CSIS in Washington, head of the China Power Project. You will not find any of them on TikTok, but you can find them right here at the FCC Zoom Room. Thank you all for joining me. It was a fantastic chat. You can find this thing posted on our FCCH uh, FCCHK.org website or on YouTube. It should be up uh, within the next 24, 48 hours if we get our act together. Thank you all for joining me. Uh, don't forget to vote in the US <laughs> if you vote. And we hope to have you here in person next time we're able to get uh, any of you to come to Hong Kong. Please give us a shout and we'll give you a stage as soon as we're allowed to do that. Again, thank you all. It was really fascinating, fascinating chat. Really love to have you. Got your book recommendations. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.